I'm Ryan O'Dowd. You're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with Section 513. We're reading Coup d'etat by Edward Lutwak. Picking up in Chapter 4, The Planning of the Coup d'etat. Personalities Outside Government The political weight of an individual in any large-scale political community will usually only be important within the framework of an organization which he heads or manipulates. It's sometimes possible for an individual to achieve political importance by becoming identified with an ideology or an attitude in which some significant part of the public believes. Kosuth, the leader of the Hungarian nationalist movement in the 1848-9 revolution, was a poet by profession and had no party machine behind him, but he did have considerable power because the masses in the cities at any rate identified his person with Hungarian nationalism. Gandhi, who operated largely outside the Congress party machine, also achieved political power because to many Indians he was the embodiment of nationalism. The remoteness of the examples indicates that such figures are very rare, and if we do have them in our target area, they should be treated as ceremonial figures. Physical Facilities Mass Media Control over the flow of information emanating from the political center will be our most important weapon in establishing our authority after the coup. The seizure of the main means of mass communication will thus be a task of crucial importance. One, though only one, of the causes of the failure of the Greek king's counter-coup in late 1967 was his inability to communicate with the masses, literally and otherwise. When Radio Larissa broadcast the king's messages, it only reached a fraction of the population. The transmitter was weak and the wavelength unusual. Instead of the booming voice of authority, the declaration took the form of a weak appeal for help. We must not make a similar mistake. Because of the short time span of the coup, and because of the likely social background of our target country, the press need not be a primary target. We will establish our authority over it after the coup, as with other aspects of the nation's life. Inevitably, the press can only play a marginal role in countries where illiteracy is widespread. In any case, it's the radio television service which is mainly associated with the voice of the government. The approximate comparative data for the Arab world in Table 12 illustrates the importance of the different media in one part of the Third World. Table 12. Mass communications in the Middle East and North Africa, mid-1967. Estimated circulation of daily newspapers, 1,500. Estimated number of television sets, 1 million. Estimated number of radio sets, 7 million. Even these figures understate the importance of radio and television sets, because while the press figures refer to circulation, i.e. estimated number of readers, rather than copies sold, the radios and television sets reach a much wider public even amongst the poorest groups, since every cafe has one. There are two problems associated with radio and television facilities from our point of view. A. There will often be many different broadcasting services and associated facilities. And B they are particularly difficult to seize. In some countries where the internal security position is precarious, the governmental radio is heavily guarded, but even where this is not the case, these facilities are difficult to seize because their staff have a uniquely extensive way of raising the alarm. As for the duplication of broadcasting facilities, even Haiti, a very small and extremely backward country, has 18 different radio stations, controlled by independent networks. Our objective is not merely to control, but also to monopolize the flow of information. We must therefore deal with every single facility. This would be difficult and would also lead to a dispersal of our forces if we tried to seize and hold every facility. Our strategy will therefore be to seize and hold just one facility, the one most closely associated with the voice of authority, while neutralizing the others. This is best done with the cooperation of some technical member of their staff who would be able to sabotage the facility from the inside. A single cooperative technician will be able temporarily to put out of action, a radio station which would otherwise require a full-scale assault team. If we are unable to recruit an internal saboteur, the next best alternative will be external sabotage. There's no need to cause any extensive damage since it will usually be possible to remove or destroy a small but essential part of the transmitter, thus effectively neutralizing the facility. The one broadcasting facility which we do have to seize and hold will present a special problem. On the one hand, our need for the facility is absolute. On the other, because it's such an obvious target, the governmental forces will certainly try to recapture it. This means that the team assigned to this target will have to be adequately staffed and equipped. 
and in order to obviate the need for the cooperation of the facility's personnel, should also include a skeleton technical staff. Appendix B on the military aspects of the coup deals inter alia with the composition of the various teams. Telecommunications. Technical progress has evolved in our favor since all the communication requirements between our own teams be carried out by the cheap and reliable two-way transistor radios now universally available. We must, however, deny the opposition the use of their fixed communication systems, because by so doing we will paralyze their reaction and prevent them from deploying against us such forces as they still control. As Figure 3 shows, the neutralization of the telecommunication facilities will be com complicated by their multiplicity, and it will be essential to achieve full coverage. The left socialist revolutionary coup against the Bolsheviks in July 1918 failed partly because it failed to comprehend the need for a monopoly of all telecommunications. The left socialist revolutionaries had infiltrated a group from the Cheka, the main instrument of Bolshevik power, and various army detachments. With these, they arrested the head of the Cheka, Dzerzhinsky, seized many public buildings in the Moscow Telegraph office. They failed, however, to seize the telephone office as well, and while they were sending cables all over Russia asking for generalized political support, Lenin used the telephone service to mobilize his fighting forces, and with these, the coup was quickly crushed. Internal security authorities were aware of the need for efficient communications, and apart from the facilities illustrated in the diagram on P121, there may be independent networks for the exclusive use of the security forces. The French Gendarmerie has a system of regional links which bypasses the public telephone and cable wires, and even in smaller countries, such as Ghana, the police can have a fully independent system. Table 13. Police telecommunication facilities in Ghana. 63 fixed wireless stations, both high-frequency and VHF radio telephones, six dual-purpose mobile radio stations, numerous man-portable radio sets. Then there's a chart. Three, telecommunication facilities available to government. Telephones, exchange, go to the police, security service, armed forces, and capital area. Telex, telegrams, post office, regional relay system, Relay Center A, Relay Center B, Relay Center C, etc. Telephones, ordinary facility to government bureaucracies and subsidiary to armed forces, police, security services. Telex, police, security services, armed forces. Independent military radio network, armed forces in capital city. Capital city military radio station, local relay A, B, C, etc. Armed forces in A, B, C, etc. In the USA, there are no national police networks. But the Department of Defense maintains a nationwide and international system, which is the largest single network in the world, and which connects every U.S. military installation with every other throughout the world. We cannot, of course, hope to seize every two-way set in the hands of the police and military authorities. But we should neutralize by external or internal sabotage those facilities which can be identified and located. There's no need to seize and hold any of these facilities and it will therefore be a matter of penetrating the central organization of each communication system for the brief period required to sabotage its operation, though again, internal sabotage will be easier and safer. City Entry Exit Road Links During the active phase of the coup, the unexpected arrival of even a small contingent of loyalist or uninfiltrated forces could seriously endanger our whole effort. When a government discovers that troops of its own armed forces are taking part in a coup in the capital city, its logical reaction may be to call on troops stationed elsewhere, in the hope that the infiltration of the armed forces is limited to those in the capital city. As it is not easy to infiltrate forces in the entire national territory, the government's hope may not be unfounded. We will attack the mechanism which could lead to the arrival of the loyalist troops in the capital city at each separate level. We will arrest those who would call them in. We will disrupt the telecommunications needed to reach them, and we will also try to isolate identified loyalist forces by direct, though purely defensive, military means. We must also prevent the intervention of these forces by controlling the last level, the perimeter of the capital city and scene of the coup. If the loyalist forces are to intervene in time, they will have to move rapidly and this will require the use of either the major roads or alternatively air transport. If we can set up efficient defensive roadblocks at the appropriate places, we should be able to deny their entry into the capital city for the short period required. That is, until we have established ourselves as the government and received the allegiance to the bulk of the state bureaucracy and military forces. 
Thus, by the time the forces of intervention have reached the scene of the action, they will be isolated band of rebels. The most suitable places to block a road with a small number of men and limited equipment, as well as the techniques and implication of such actions, are discussed in Appendix B and also in Chapter 5, where we deal with the direct neutralization of the identified loyalist forces. Figure 4 illustrates the locations which would be chosen in a particular synthetic example. But our control of the physical access to the capital city will also serve other purposes. It will be one of the ways in which we will establish the physical presence of the new regime, and it will also allow us to prevent the escape of government leaders and other personalities which we have been unable to arrest. One of the dangers which we will face will be the revitalization of counter-coup opposition, which could result if a major governmental figure escapes from the capital city and joins loyalist elements outside it. After all the efforts we have made to neutralize such forces by internal means, and by interference with their transport and communications, our whole work could be endangered. The loyalist forces could fail to reach the capital, but the political leadership could reach them. The means at our disposal will not be sufficient to steal hermetically the entire capital city, though of course much will depend on its location and spatial spread. Brasilia, though open on all sides, would be easy to seal off simply by closing the airport, since the surface links are inadequate to allow rapid movement to the rest of the country. Helsinki, on the other hand, would be spatially convenient because, though not remote from the rest of the country, it is surrounded by sea and lakes so that a number of roadblocks would effectively seal it. Focal Traffic Points The sight of tanks in the main squares of the capital city has become a symbol of the coup, but is also an expression of a very real practical requirement, the need to establish a physical presence in the center of political activity. Every capital city has an area which is the local equivalent of Whitehall in the UK or Capitol Hill in the USA in or near which the main political administrative facilities are concentrated. We will select and defend certain positions around and within this area, and by so doing we will achieve a variety of purposes. The positions will form a ring around the main area within which our active teams will operate so as to protect them from any hostile forces which may have penetrated the capital city. They will assist in establishing our authority by giving visual evidence of our power. They will filter movement to and around the area, thus enabling us to capture those whom we have been unable to arrest directly. In order to achieve these different objectives, our blocking positions must be individually strong, since otherwise they may tempt any extant loyal forces into a counterattack. In any case, unless adequately staffed, they will be unable to act as efficient filters to individual movements. We must therefore resist the temptation to secure every important location by blocking positions which are individually weak. As only a few of the possible locations will in fact be covered, it's essential to select them with special care. Focal traffic points will be easier to select in a coastal or river line city, where a definite shape has been imposed to the capital city and to the traffic flow within it. This is illustrated by figure 5. In each particular case, the area which is the center of political and bureaucratic activity will be well known to the local inhabitants, and will therefore be a matter of selecting a perimeter of straight and fairly broad streets, at the intersection of which we will establish our blocking positions. The avenues and boulevards of Paris are ideal from this point of view. Airports and other transport facilities One of the classic moves in the period immediately following the coup is the closure of airports and the cancellation of all flights. This is part of the general tactic which aims at freezing the situation by preventing the uncontrolled flow of people and information. There will also be other more specific objectives. By closing the airport, we will prevent the escape of those governmental leaders whom we have been unable to arrest. We will also prevent any inflow of loyalist forces into the area of the capital city. Because of the short time span in which the coup takes place, air transport will be of very good importance. Either we or the government should tip the balance of forces by flying in quite small contingents of our respective supporters. The size of the forces which can be moved by air may well be very small, but in the context of the delicate balance of the active phase of the coup, they could still play a decisive role. Air transport is, however, very vulnerable insofar as it still relies on long and uninterrupted landing strips. Therefore, if at all possible, we should avoid having to rely on it. To the extent that we are independent of support arriving by air, we should therefore prevent the use of all airfields in and around the area of the capital city. Some of these airfields will be military ones, but even if they are not, they may still be heavily guarded. This could be a serious obstacle if the government still controls significant military forces outside the capital city, and if transport planes are available to bring them into it. Seizing a defended airfield will certainly be difficult, but denying the use of one is very easy. 
A few vehicles parked on the runway, either by covert means or by a little cooperation from the inside, and covered by a small fire team to prevent them from being moved, will suffice to neutralize an entire airport. A few warning shots from suitable positions could also prevent any landings taking place. Other organized forms of transport will only rarely be important in modern conditions. In many undeveloped countries, railways play a very marginal role in the transport structure. Even when they are important economically, they will often be removed from the main population centers, having been built to connect mines and plantations with deep sea ports as part of the colonial export economy rather than as links between the main population centers. In Europe and those parts of Latin America where this is not the case, railways will still be unimportant from our point of view because of the time element. In any case, railways are extremely easy to neutralize. In the 1926 coup of Poland, staged by Pilsudski, a great deal of the action revolved around the railway system, but rail-borne troops never arrived in time to decide the issue because both sides found it easy to prevent the other's movements, though not to ensure their own. Whereas in Ethiopia the railways are important, or rather the single Addis Ababa to Djibouti railway line is important, technical neutralization should be used. Railways rely on a technical chain system par excellence, and if a single section of rail or signals is sabotaged, the whole system will be temporarily stopped. The gap between two sections of rails easily crossed, but probably there will be no rolling stock on the other side. Public Buildings the need to provide the bureaucracy and the masses with visual evidence of the reality and power of the coup is one of the continuing elements in our analysis. Otherwise, this will be the least defined and coherent of our groups of targets. The buildings which we will have to seize in every case will be the residence of those government leaders whom we have selected for arrest, and those buildings which house facilities that we require, such as the radio television building. In the first case, it will be a matter of brief penetration to achieve capture or arrest. In the second, however, we will have to seize and occupy the building, and perhaps resist attempts made to recapture it. But there will be other official buildings which we will also have to occupy, or at any rate control the access to. Those can only be loosely defined as those buildings whose possession is associated with the possession of political power. Most countries have some form of elected assembly, a parliament or its local equivalent, but in many of them, political power emanates from the palace of the president or other ruler or the central committee of the party. We should not be deceived by constitutional fictions. And after spending so much effort distinguishing between effective political power and its symbols, we will not make the mistake of using our scarce resources on the latter. Nevertheless, there will be certain symbolic buildings which could play an important role in the crucial transitional phase of the coup. Their possession by one side or the other will act as a signal to the masses and the rank and file of the bureaucracy in the confused period when it is unclear which side is in control. Our possession of those symbols will then give us the allegiance of those who are waiting to choose one side or the other. Thus, though useless in direct material terms, it may well be worthwhile to seize those buildings which have a powerful symbolic value. In the Ghana coup of 1966, which brought down the Nkumram regime, the very efficient and practical-minded leaders of the coup felt it necessary to fight their way into the presidential residence, Flagstaff House, though it contained neither Nkumram himself nor any important technical facilities. They realized that though it was an empty symbol par excellence, its possession was essential to secure the support of the Accra masses, who naturally associated the control of political power with that particular building. Fortunately, by the very nature of such symbols, there will be one, or at most two, such symbolic buildings whose possession will be an essential requirement. Apart from the purely symbolic buildings, there will be others whose possession is highly desirable. These are the administrative headquarters of the Army, Police, and Security Service. Thus, in each case, this group of targets will include the following. A. The seat of effective political power. This could be the royal or presidential palace, or the building of the elected assembly, or the party presidium, or central committee. B. The main administrative buildings, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of the Interior, police and military headquarters, if separate. C. Symbolic buildings. Often the appropriate building will fall into one or the other of the classifications above, where, however, there is a cultural lag between the development of the country's political life and the traditional attitudes. The masses will still associate political power with an obsolete building. The coup will be practically over by the time the citizenry wakes up and starts to investigate the possession of buildings, symbolic or otherwise. We can therefore postpone the occupation of some of these targets to the later stages. 
Since in direct practical terms other targets will be more important, or at any rate more urgent, the best way of dealing with the symbolic and administrative targets will be to use them as assembly points for those teams which have already completed their primary mission. Thus concludes Section 513 of Coup d'Etat by Edward Lutwak. Still on Chapter 4, Planning of the Coup d'Etat. Tomorrow we will continue with Section 514. Still in pl- Chapter 4, Planning the Coup d'Etat, Neutralizing the Political Forces to Particular Groups. I will see you then. Olam.